Okay, so we can, good afternoon everybody and hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar on diabetes remission in Malaysia and Asia, is it possible? Now we're going to just wait a few seconds for everyone to join in. Chuyong, do you want me to start now or we wait for a little while? We'll wait a little while, yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar on diabetes remission in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Is it possible? Now this webinar is brought to you by the Center for Transformative Nutrition and Health at IMU in collaboration with the Malaysian Endocrine and Metabolic Society, MEMS, and the Malaysian Dietitians Association. I'm Winnie Chi, I'm from CTNH IMU and I will be moderating this webinar. Now, type 2 diabetes is now recognized to be potentially reversible condition with the possibility of long-term remission. The latest Malaysian type 2 diabetes CPG has included recommendations on the effectiveness of bariatric surgery and the use of dietary intervention to be considered in selected patients with aims of diabetes remission. Therefore, it is indeed timely for us to dive deeper into this topic of using dietary intervention for diabetes remission. In the next two hours, we'll be listening to four eminent speakers from, from Malaysia as well as from the United Kingdom. We will start off with Dr. Dr. Zanaria to set the scene by discussing the challenges of managing diabetes and the importance of lifestyle intervention, followed by presentations to UK colleagues on the evidence of remission using proven dietary approaches. Dr. Leeds will be providing the latest results from various dietary approaches, while Professor Susan Chet will share the evidence from a series of trials conducted at Oxford, and Professor Paul Eviat will discuss the long-term impact of weight loss on diabetes and cardiovascular risk. Indeed, you would agree with me that these are all important aspects that we need to understand better as physicians, as dietitians, as nurses, and healthcare professionals to help improve the lives of the people with diabetes that we see daily in our practice. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to tell you that we have an overwhelming response of more than a thousand participants with us today. I can already see that more than 200 have started to lock in and I'm sure more will be joining us soon. I would just like to remind you that all your microphones have been muted. So please type your questions at the Q&A panel, not on the chat panel, but the Q&A panel in Zoom and we will attend to your questions towards the end of all the four presentations. And I would like to let you know that this webinar is actually being recorded. And for some participants, you can also go to FB Live in order to listen to us 
on while we discuss this important topic of diabetes remission. Now, I am not going to waste any more time, and I would like to introduce our first speaker. She is none other than Dr. Zanaria Hussein. Dr. Zanaria actually needs no introduction for us in Malaysia, but nevertheless, since we have participants from Singapore, from uh, Indonesia, as well as from Australia and the Middle East, I would like to introduce that Dr. Zanaria is currently the head of the endocrine unit at Hospital Putrajaya and head of the endocrinology subspecialty service of the Malaysian Ministry of Health. She chairs the MOH Endocrine Fellowship Training Program, as well as Endocrine Drug Review Committee and Endocrine Subspecialty Subcommittee of the National Specialist Register. Now, Dr. Dosazana has a very impressive CV, but she is very much involved in training, undergraduate, postgraduate, and fellowship teaching and training. She's involved in many CPGs, including for diabetes, obesity, thyroid diseases, dyslipidemia, and cardiovascular prevention in women. Dr. Dr. Zanara is interested in areas related to diabetes technology, adrenal, and neuroendocrine tumors. She is the immediate past president of MEMS and a member of the advisory boards of NADI, the National Diabetes Institute, and the Malaysian Diabetes Educator Society. And most of all, I know Dr. Zanara well. She's a good friend of mine. And I'm very pleased to hand over the floor to you to talk about diabetes, our challenge in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Over to you, Dr. Zanaria. Thank you so much, uh, Winnie, for such a kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Salams to all of you, uh, and uh, especially to uh, my uh, esteemed uh, panel of speakers, fellow speakers uh, all the way in the UK who have started their day so early over there. Um, so uh, it is indeed an honor to actually be uh, with you all this afternoon. And uh, the topic is one that I'm really sort of have a passion about. And as a clinician and endocrinologist, while well, you know, we're chasing uh, you know, the, the ever-growing pharmacotherapy for diabetes, I think it's equally very important to actually uh, focus on the other end, which is lifestyle uh, uh, and its important role in reversing diabetes. But um, I'm here because uh, I need to portray to you, start the ball rolling by showing you the burden of diabetes that we have in this part of the world. So um, that's going to be my task for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, so what we have in my first slide here, if you don't mind, is just a reference to the last or most recent IDF Diabetes Atlas, yeah, which is the ninth edition in 2019. The 10th uh, edition indeed will be uh, ready, I, I, I suppose, in 2021, as they say. But uh, let's just glance through a few figures of the global diabetes uh, pandemic and its prevalence. And we see, uh, as you can see nicely in the left side of the slide, um, that the rates or the numbers of people with diabetes are inclining and the rate of incline uh, is actually getting steeper. And uh, the projected figures in fact are actually higher each time when they've actually done a, a, a later estimate, as you can see. So in 2019, um, there is about 460, um, million diabetic, uh, diabetics in the world and projected to reach uh, you know, 700 by the year 2045, but it's just uh, 20, uh, less than a quarter of a century uh, forward. Yeah? And we can see the figures here where the global prevalence of diabetes is about 9% in 2019. Uh, and um, when we look uh, ahead um, in the following slide, also from the IDF 2019, just highlighting a few statements from the Atlas is uh, that the increasing prevalence of diabetes worldwide is an interplay between um, not only internal factors within the individual, but also external factors. Yeah? So it's an interplay between genetic factors as well as socioeconomic, demographic and environmental factors. Um, certainly most of the increase in uh, diabetes is due to the uh, escalation of type 2 diabetes and its related risk factors, uh, primarily the rise in levels of obesity, unhealthy uh, calorie and energy dense diets, and widespread uh, physical inactivity, which I will portray to you the problem that we have in Malaysia. But there are also uh, apparently increases in childhood onset type 1 diabetes. But what we're seeing in our part of the world in Asia, in fact, is an increase in childhood onset type 2 diabetes. Yeah? Um, uh, again, with the growing urbanization and changing lifestyle habits, uh, 
that we uh, see in the Asian continent primarily, uh, there is higher calorie intake, increased consumption of processed foods and sedentary lifestyles. And these are all contributing to the increasing prevalence of type two diabetes. Um, there also is a mention about the um, closing the gap between the uh, prevalence of diabetes in uh, with, uh, comparing the urban and rural areas as mentioned also in the IDF Atlas. Um, again, I'm showing you the global map. Uh, and uh, as I had quoted the figures before, 460 million in the world and actually more than half are actually in Asia. Yeah, uh, it, it, the IDF actually breaks up the global map into seven different regions. And uh, usually Malaysia is in Southeast Asia, but for the IDF, Southeast Asia is actually the Indian subcontinent. Yeah? And in Southeast Asia, which actually includes India and uh, the, the neighboring countries, we can see that the numbers with diabetes are about 88 million 2019 and actually forecasted to have the most uh, uh, rapid or uh, increment uh, in, in the following decades. Yeah? And second to that is the Western Pacific region where we are in, yeah? where we now have 160 million, which is more than a third of the diabetics in the whole globe, and is set to also increase at a rate of 30% in the next couple of decades. This slide I have also um, taken from the IDF Atlas 2019, and I wanted to portray the top 10 uh, countries uh, with diabetes in terms of numbers, but also in terms of prevalence. So here in this um, first image you have in front of you, we can see that certainly the top two countries are from Asia, China and India contributing up to 200 million, yeah, almost half of the entire diabetic population in the world is in these two countries. Yeah? And following that, you can also appreciate other countries that are from Western Pacific region and Southeast Asia, being Pakistan, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. Yeah? When we look at the top 10 countries in terms of prevalence, we can see the highest prevalence comes from the uh, Marshall Islands, and the rest are also uh, from the other Pacific Islands. Um, and the rates in the top 10, the prevalence rates are actually ranging from near 20% to up to 30%. So I've actually included Malaysia's prevalence from our National Health Mobility Survey, which I'll elude further later, and that's a shocking 18.3%. So we may very well be number 11 on the globe based on our most recent survey, which was also uh, in the same year of 2019. So certainly what I've shown you is Asia is the global epicenter of diabetes. We appreciate uh, Asians tend to develop diabetes at a lower BMI than Caucasians, uh, at a younger age, with earlier onset of complications, and with more frequent postprandial hyperglycemia. So we know from some studies in the West, as well as in uh, our part of the world in Asia, that the contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia uh, in Asians towards HbA1c runs across the uh, different quintiles of A1c, as you can see here, as opposed to in a Caucasian population, in a paper quoted by Monnier in 2003, often quoted, is that um, at A1c's that are actually higher, that the main contributor is the postprandial, whereas at the A1c's which are actually uh, uh, sorry, fasting glucose and lower A1Cs uh, when the postprandial are actually contributing. But in Asians, postprandial hyperglycemia contributes to the A1C right across the spectrum. It's also notable, especially in Malaysia as well, that the risks of renal complications are much higher in Asia. And 60% uh, of Asian patients with type 2 diabetes have uh, albuminuria as compared to half uh, you know, of that in the comparative Western cohort. So um, now I actually focus on the uh, Western Pacific region or the area where Southeast Asia is actually included. Again, referring to the IDF Atlas 2019, I'm sorry to put up so many figures and maps, but I guess I'm sort of zoning in into Southeast Asia and finally Malaysia. So the, the regional prevalence uh, in this region is almost 10%, yeah? Uh, and uh, also important is looking at pre-diabetes and in this situation, impaired glucose tolerance, which is a forecast of future diabetes, there's about 8%. Yeah? 
an undiagnosed diabetes rate is a little bit more than half. Yeah? So that one out of every two diabetics in the region or a little bit more than one out of every two are yet to be diagnosed and managed well. Um, I've also uh, put the map of Southeast Asia here and clipped out all the prevalences of the different countries. And this is in reference to the IDF 2019. So we can appreciate that in Southeast Asia, many countries have so-called still a low prevalence, especially that in Indochina, if you can appreciate in Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, still having a uh, prevalence of about 5% and less. Uh, Indonesia, Philippines, um, and um, Thailand, uh, uh, probably a little bit higher on the on, on the list with six to eight percent, but clearly, you know, you can see that in Singapore and in Brunei, uh, both sharing almost a, a similar uh, racial mix uh, uh, in the population as Malaysia are already having uh, prevalence rates of um, thirteen and fourteen percent. So Malaysia, in fact, you know, in twenty nineteen by the IDF is estimated to have a prevalence of 16.8%. So truly the highest in the Southeast Asian region. So if, if, South, if uh, you know, Southeast Asia is the epicenter, you know, or, or the Western Pacific region is the epicenter of diabetes on the globe, certainly Malaysia is the epicenter, you know, Southeast Asian epicenter for diabetes. Yeah? And as I mentioned, when we did our actual population survey, in fact, the prevalence is far higher than that estimated by the IDF in that same year, which is actually 18.3%. So now let me allow you to share, especially with our colleagues from the UK, um, as most of you already know, the, stat, the statistics of the uh, Malaysian diabetes burden. Yeah? But so in 2019, when we did the National Health Mobility Survey, which has been sort of done every four to five years, and here we can uh, actually see right in the middle on the top uh, is the graph looking at the last uh, three surveys, uh, four years apart, 2011, 2015, and 2019. I've given you the figure of 18.3% before, and that equates to about one in five adults in the country with diabetes. And if we look at our adult population, that amounts to 3.9 million adults with diabetes, yeah? Um, the blue or turquoise line tells us that a little less than half are undiagnosed, yeah? And uh, also to note that the rate of undiagnosed diabetes is rising a little bit more rapidly than the rate of diagnosed uh, diabetes or established diabetes at the time of the survey. Um, down here also uh, is important uh, to appreciate that the rates of uh, these are uh, age-related uh, prevalence of diabetes we know increases with age. And looking at the uh, sort of bar chart at the bottom, we appreciate that if we look at the 18 to 29 uh, age group, there's about almost 6% uh, presence of diabetes in the young adults, of which about 90% is yet to be diagnosed. And at the end of the spectrum, if we're looking at our older population of 60 and above, we're seeing about one in two and a half adults or 40% with um, uh, diabetes, yeah? Um, yes, and as I had quoted about the concern of diabetes in young adults, which amounts to about one in 17 uh, adults in this age group of 18 to sort of just below 30, and that amounts to about 400,000 uh, young adults in Malaysia of which uh, only one out of 10 of them have been diagnosed as according to our survey. Um, and uh, the numbers that have uh, diabetes above 65 are about 800,000 uh, with diabetes and about three out of four are being diagnosed. So I've just actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, put that uh, slide up again or the, 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 the chart up again for you to see clearly now the, the rates of diabetes according to each age uh, group interval. Uh, and you can see how uh, the rate of undiagnosed diabetes is really much higher in the younger age group versus the older age group. Um, something very important to highlight and gives us the, you know, a fear and anxiety that this impending doom coming because uh, the latest survey in 2019 gave a shocking figure of 23.6% of so-called pre-diabetes, which is totally unexpected. 
uh, if, uh, you know, the National Health Mobility Survey in Malaysia, uh, what it does to actually get the um, sort of uh, defined diabetes and prediabetes is by actually asking a history. So if there is a history of diabetes, then there's known diabetes. If there is no history of diabetes, then uh, after a fast overnight, then a finger break, capillary finger break is taken in a fasting state. And that will then define whether you have diabetes uh, which is 7.0 and above. And if you have the, uh, the figure of uh, 5.6 to 6.9, then it's classified as impaired fasting glucose. And you can see how this level has increased so, so much. And therefore, these are the individuals that we predict will probably contribute to a rapid rise in our diabetes figures in the near future. Then to just share what our diabetes, how our uh, 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 what, how our patients are, or what, what, are, what are the characteristics of the diabetics in the country, and so a bit of demographic data for our colleagues in the UK to understand. Malaysia is special um, that it has, you know, uh, three major ethnic groups, um, the Malays, the Chinese, and the Indians, and so we often call ourselves truly Asia, yeah? Um, so there is some ethnic difference in the prevalence of diabetes, and we can see here in the Malays, about one in four, in the Chinese, one in seven, and in, among the Indians, the prevalence is as high as one in three, yeah? and not very much difference in terms of urban rural uh, uh, presence of diabetes in our country. Um, this is something uh, important to know, especially with the topic that we are discussing today with lifestyle and diabetes remission. Um, these are figures from the National Health Mobility Survey looking at the uh, body weight. Yeah? And what we can see, uh, and BMI in fact actually, categorizing uh, individuals according to their BMI. Yeah? And uh, whether they're overweight to obese, and also whether they have abdominal adiposity. So in the overall group of the National Health Mobility Survey, we can see that one out of two Malaysians, adults, because the study was done in those 18 and above, have overweight to obesity. 20% yeah, have obesity. One in two also have waist circumferences that are define abdominal obesity. If we're looking just at the those with diabetes, whether they're known diabetes or whether they were newly detected diabetes during the time of the survey, we can see that two thirds of those with established diagnosis of diabetes have overweight obesity, and almost two thirds as well with those newly diagnosed. And in those with impaired fasting, half are also having the issue of overweight obesity. And as well, you can appreciate the rates of abdominal obesity, which are also quite high, very high. Yeah? So in then defining the high cardiovascular risk. Uh, we did mention about physical inactivity as one of the reasons why di diabetes and uh, rates are also increasing. And uh, interesting to note also that among those who have been diagnosed with diabetes, actually one in three are defined in the study as physically inactive. Yeah? And one in four among those who are newly diagnosed or not yet known uh, diabetic prior to the study uh, are actually inactive. So we have a high rate of physical inactivity, a high rate of obesity, overweight, abdominal adiposity among the Malaysian uh, public uh, in those with uh, diabetes and pre-diabetes. We're also going to dwell on primary care later on. So I thought it important to share some of the primary care data uh, in the, uh, with all. Uh, with regards to um, the National Diabetes Registry, which actually accumulates the clinical data for patients that are in the Ministry of Health Primary Care uh, Clinic Diabetes Service. So, um, so to date, um, referring to a report uh, that was published uh, last year in 2020, which accumulates the figures of 2013 to 2014, um, there have been about 1.6 million patients enrolled in the National Diabetes Registry since the start. But for the year 2019, about close to 900,000 patients were active in the registry. And you can have a look at most of the patients being followed up. In fact, almost absolutely 99.3% are those with type 2 diabetes. Yeah? So type 1 diabetes is usually followed up in hospitals, especially with um, um, endocrinology clinics. Yeah? 
Um, so let's have a quick look at the, uh, you know, the characteristics of the primary care diabetics we have. So the mean age was 53, and you can see it's highlighted here that there are quite a substantial number of diabetics in primary care that have been diagnosed before the age of 40. Yeah? So we have a young, a presence of young diabetes in our community. As, along with that, it, we are, uh, of, of course, um, cognizant of the fact that the comorbidity rates are very high. These all actually uh, sort of uh, accumulate to be the cardiovascular risk. So the proportion of diabetes patients with hypertension from 2013 to 2019 has increased from about um, three quarters to actually four out of five patients having elevated blood pressure and also from a little bit more than half, now we know that three quarters of patients also have issues with their lipids that have to be addressed together with their glycemic control when they do attend primary care clinics. Um, forgive me for the numbers uh, from this table, but they just show sort of the mean uh, you know, performance of the different cardiovascular risk factors that we um, sort of um, monitor for the patients in the uh, diabetes registry. Um, and you can see here the figures from 2013 to 2019. So um, just uh, concentrating on the figure at the most extreme left, which depicts the latest, most recent figures, you can appreciate that the blood pressure, mean blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, the lipid parameters. Yeah? But really what is best to highlight is actually that we are having diabetics in primary care with the issue of abdominal adiposity, and also with our cutoff point of obesity being about 27, they're actually bordering on obesity already. Yeah? So that has to be definitely addressed specifically. Yeah? Weight management is a very important sort of, uh, uh, target uh, in our patients with diabetes in Malaysia. Um, probably I'm showing a lot of figures, but you know, just for you to glance through and for our colleagues in the UK to realize, in primary care, only about a third of patients are achieving a recommended A1C below 6.5%. And that hasn't changed very much, even though we have so much more new medications and better trained individuals in the diabetes care team and better guidelines. The mean A1C in primary care is, has just for the first time dropped a little bit below 8%. And if we look at blood pressure as well as the cholesterol, we also appreciate that actually two thirds, uh, about two thirds of our patients still do not have, uh, you know, ideal blood pressure sort of control as well as lipid control. So are still actually having excess cardiovascular risk. Yeah? Um, medications, uh, I, I show this because I think it's important when we're thinking about diabetes remission, then we're looking at people who are possibly on uh, you know, uh, uh, not too many medications and oral medications and maybe also on diet therapy. So in our primary care clinics in the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, uh, only 5% uh, in 2019 were on diet only and only about less than 30% are on monotherapy. Yeah? So maybe these would be at least you know, the target group, the third that could actually possibly be selected for this um, uh, strategy of diabetes remission, and possibly another third uh, or a bit more that have uh, on oral anti-diabetics only can also, you know, possibly be targeted at least for, uh, uh, you know, uh, weight reduction strategies and reduction in pharmacotherapy and possibly even diabetes remission. So what is uh, something to alert as well is, um, you know, you know in a way, uh, with um, guidelines that sort of focus on intensification of treatment, there's a drive to be, uh, you know, starting more therapies and uh, more insulin is started. And we can see the jump in insulin rates in Malaysia. There's very high rates of insulinization in primary care. So currently, one in three patients in primary care are on insulin, yeah, either alone or with other medications. And this has been the trend. So over about 10 years, it has tripled. The rate of insulin in primary care has tripled from about 11% to 30%. Whereas of course, uh, as we expected, the insulin rates in hospital care, which I haven't shared with data about hospital care, uh, are, are high and expected to be high. Yeah? Because these are patients that have already sort of failed primary care 
sort of follow up and are actually uh, requiring more intense uh, intensive therapies along with their uh, higher load of comorbidities and complications. Um, I would like to share with you importantly is the rates of complications also just to be aware. Um, and so this slide also taken from National Diabetes Registry uh, report shows as the uh, percentage or prevalence of complications in primary care over the years. And the topmost green line is in fact nephropathy. So the rates of nephropathy have definitely inclined. Yeah? The rates of retinopathy as well, and we think that's probably due to better screening with fundus cameras available in primary care. But otherwise, the other, rate, uh, other conditions seem to be actually quite steadily stable yeah, in terms of prevalence. Yeah? Um, but this is uh, something to really highlight, yeah? uh, the property rates that are high. So we had looked at um, you know, the cost of managing complications, and, and we realized that you know, most of the cost, even though this was a study done 10 years ago, looking at the annual cost of managing diabetes in the country, which came to, which is heavily subsidized because this is in government uh, care of 1.4 billion, 1 billion, which is actually two thirds uh, or, or, or more than that is actually contributed to the cost of managing complications yeah, related to um, target organ damage. And only one third of the cost, uh, 450 million or so is contributed to by the uh, outpatient care that we are giving the uh, uh, patients with diabetes in, in, in Malaysia. So, uh, you know, we're not short of guidelines uh, that actually um, are there to guide and standardize treatment for managing diabetes. And uh, Prof. Winnie had mentioned that we had launched our latest guideline, uh, just um, uh, Diabetes 2020. And uh, so uh, the guidelines are very heavy on, you know, uh, a lot of pharmacotherapy, as you can see. So just um, taking the algorithm from the latest guidelines, we see that of course lifestyle modification is the you know the the, the primary sort of first step you know, once diabetes is diagnosed, and quickly following that, according to the A1C at diagnosis, uh, you know uh, doctors are sort of uh, guided to actually go on a strategy of uh, either lifestyle if the A1C is just less than six and a half percent or actually go on to monotherapy or dual therapy and so on and so forth. And there's this um, urge to actually not be inert in treatment and keep sort of optimizing medications yeah? uh, every three to six months, either the dose or adding on different therapies if the A1C is actually uh, not uh, achieved. Uh, although there is a highlight here that lifestyle uh, modification must be maintained throughout. Yeah? Um, and again, uh, you know, there is this uh, sort of guidance uh, into, you know, which medical therapies or pharmacotherapies for diabetes uh, should be used first and which sequence to use. Um, and if you look at this slide, uh, which shows you the different algorithms um, over here for overweight and obesity in the extreme uh, sort of uh, left here, you can see that overweight obesity there is a mention of weight loss through lifestyle modification as the first step. Yeah? But of course, lifestyle modification is there from the very beginning. Uh, as Winnie had mentioned, uh, for the first time, the CPG uh, Type 2 Diabetes 2020 um, has uh, mentioned uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, specific term of diabetes remission, what we are discussing today. Uh, and it is there in the recommendation that you know, meal replacements as well as very low calorie dietary intervention can be considered in selected patients with the aims of achieving diabetes remission. Yeah? So I'm just ending, but I'd like to actually quote one study that uh, Prof. Winnie headed and I was uh, glad to be part of and also some efforts into actually uh, uh, you know, lifestyle intervention and nutritional intervention. We embark on this um, uh, diabetes nutrition uh, algorithm back in 2013. Uh, and um, following this, uh, we all went ahead with a specific study, which Prof. Winnie headed uh, a structured lifestyle intervention using this nutritional algorithm in primary care among patients with type 2 diabetes only on oral medications. And it was a randomized control trial. Um, I know there's a lot of figures here. But uh, it looked into um, you know, using the nutritional algorithm with motivational interviewing, 
versus the nutritional algorithm with um, conventional counseling and versus just uh, standard care. Yeah? And you can see the typical patient in primary care having you know, a BMI of between 28 to 30, their A1Cs, despite being on a couple of oral anti-diabetics of near 8%, yeah, and this was the kind of calorie intake and physical activity profile they had uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, and this just shows the intervention. Uh, I know I'm short of time, but uh, here it is. Um, uh, the calorie intake prescribed between 1,002 to 1,500 kilocalories per day with meal plans and the concept of meal replacement therapy uh, and also the behavioral component and exercise as well as nutritional education and also the approach of motivational interviewing or conventional counseling versus just the usual uh, counseling yeah, uh, without um, uh, a specific uh, motivational interviewing. And this was a six month study and then a follow on to, for another six months to complete a year. And quickly, I'll just share with you the most uh, remarkable findings in this study, which has been published since is that um, you know, there was a good weight change, especially in the group with motivational interviewing. You can see the weight had dropped to about 6% from baseline at six months um, and, and later a gradual uh, incline, but that also coincided with an improvement in A1C of up to almost 1% yeah? uh, um, over here. And together with that also improvement in cardiovascular risk factors uh, like uh, risk markers as well, like waist circumference, uh, blood pressure, yeah, um, as well as, um, um, yeah, body fat, as you can see here, yeah. So uh, uh, what is most interesting, and since we're in the topic of diabetes remission as well, is the fact that those that had the um, nutritional algorithm along with the uh, you know, intervention of counseling, there were up to one in five who could actually reduce their medications. Yeah? Uh, whereas in the usual care group, up to a third of patients uh, required an increment in medication. So that concept now is quite clear that with weight reduction, with nutritional intervention, and with appropriate uh, counseling, that guiding patients to lose weight will do good for their weight, their A1Cs, and in fact may lead to actually a reduction in need of medications. Yeah. So um, at the end now, uh, just to highlight the challenges and gaps we have in diabetes care in Malaysia, that we have a high prevalence of pre-diabetes, as mentioned, of undiagnosed diabetes, of diabetes affecting young adults, as also mentioned earlier, of overweight and obesity rates are extremely high, yeah, uh, about 66% among diabetics in the country, 84% uh, among the primary care uh, to the cohort of diabetes. Uh, physical inactivity rates are significant as also alluded to, one in four of those undiagnosed and one in three of those diagnosed. Um, and among those treated in primary care, we can still see that glycemic control and cardiovascular risk factor control are still not very optimal. There's still not optimal nutrition intervention and actually no specific weight management programs for our diabetics in primary care, let alone in hospital care. Yeah? But what we have, I guess, is a lot of newer glycemic lowering therapies that we're trying to get out there, you know, that are available uh, to make a difference. Yeah. Um, but also, most important is that we also uh, invest in good lifestyle intervention. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess these are strategies to sort of confront those um, gaps and challenges. Uh, uh, again, a public health approach of preventing diabetes and pre-diabetes is very important. Early diagnosis by actively screening program in adults and Early diagnosis and early diabetes uh, will give room to the possibility of diabetes remission. And where we have diagnosed diabetes early, then we need to intervene. Yeah? Uh, and, and as seen, uh, getting to the targets recommended not only for glucose and other risk factors, uh, investing in patient education and nutritional management, and selecting appropriate anti-diabetic therapies um, that most of the time clinicians like myself are doing day in and day out. And, and trying to optimize and intensify, but not just pharmacotherapy, but also very importantly, lifestyle intervention, yeah? As well as dealing with complications 
uh, and reducing macrovascular and cardiovascular risk reduction. Yeah. So I guess uh, I end here by actually putting that one strategy that is missing from our list and should be really up there uh, is actually um, to see in a selected group of our diabetics whether diabetes remission is possible. Thank you very much for listening uh, and um, I wish everybody well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zanaria. I've always enjoyed listening to you. I, I always listen to you on when you do this uh, over so well. And each time um, you give us new data, I'm glad to, to see that you've shared the diabetes um, uh, data, not only from NHMS, but also from the registry. And I'm as anxious as you that when we see it as Malaysians, um, we seem to be getting worse. And you've also highlighted that um, lifestyle is so very important. And our CPG has got so much on drugs and that box on lifestyle. And yet there's so much we need to do there. And thank you for sharing the results uh, we've done together in our research. And actually it's possible, right? For me, that study on TDMA showed that diabetes, uh, we can make it better for our patients by emphasizing more on nutrition and their lifestyle. Um, and you're right, we perhaps should take that a bit further and start to look at diabetes remission next. So I'm sure there'll be questions coming up on how do we implement that in the Malaysian scenario as we go through the other speakers. So you can relax now, Dr. Zanaria, and we'll listen to the other speakers and we'll come back towards the end as, uh, for our question and answer. So thank you for a very excellent lecture there. Um, I'm very happy now to move on to introduce our next speaker and that, that's Dr. Anthony Leeds. And Dr. Leeds has got I think uh, an important role here that he will be sharing with us on the updates on the evidence for the dietary approaches. I know Dr. Leeds in Malaysia, we are, there's lots of um, you know, interest in looking at various dietary approaches for diabetes management, um, including low carbon ketogenic diet. And now when we heard about the direct trial and the you know, total diet replacement, uh, liquid diets, is that possible for us? So that's, that will be Dr. Leeds' role next to share with us on that. But first, let me do a proper introduction for Dr. Leeds. He's a very, very close friend of the IMU. Dr. Leeds is, in fact, our uh, honorary adjunct professor at our, my School of Health Sciences in IMU. Um, he's actually supposed to be retired, but he doesn't seem to retire. But he was initially with uh, King's College in London until September 2007 where he was a senior lecturer. Then he joined the Cambridge Weight Plan uh, as a medical director. And I think we've seen him several times in Malaysia speaking at Nadi, talking about the role of uh, very low calorie diets. And now Dr. Leeds has not retired yet. He's now the chairman of the TDMR Europe Group. This is a European industry group that works with the European Commission, EFSA, and also national agencies. And what he's doing is really something that he's very passionate about. Uh, he promotes, uh, his role is to optimize legislation and educate the public officials and healthcare professionals about obesity, comorbidities, and the role of diet in management. But Dr. Leeds himself is also very interested in, in, in research, and his current research interest is very much on low energy diets and very low energy diets for weight management in clinical practice. And he works a lot with colleagues from Parker Institute at the Federisberg Hospital in Copenhagen, also hold several uh, honorary appointments at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, as well as in Glasgow, Scotland. So Dr. Leeds, over to you, share with us the latest updates on dietary approaches for diabetes remission. Over to you, Dr. Leeds. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just check, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Good, great. Um, okay, so I'm now going to do a very, very quick review uh, of, of the evidence. and. and comment on one or two things that I think are of particular interest uh, in relation to what we're going to see over the coming years. Um, but I begin by declaring my uh, disclosures, but you've heard about those already. So I'm going to move on now to uh, just remind us that we're at, a, at the point where we're just about to uh, mark the uh, work done in Toronto on the extraction of insulin and the first use of insulin. Uh, the work started in May 1921 with Banting and Best, and then James Collett joined them in the autumn of 1921, and by 1922 they'd produced some uh, insulin extracts which were uh, usable and indeed were used clinically during that year. Uh, but the reason I've also done this is just as a reminder that before the introduction of insulin, the diets of people with diabetes were uh, very restricted. They were energy restricted with fast days, they were very high in protein, very high in fat, and very low in carbohydrate, and probably 
providing as prescribed, although maybe they were not particularly compliant, uh, as low as 5% of dietary energy. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is um, consider this in relation to some other interesting things. We've heard that there's been a global rise in the prevalence of uh, diabetes, but of course we also know there's been a global rise in the prevalence of obesity and overweight. And while there are variations, say, between North America and Europe in relation to population average weight gains, what we can be fairly certain of is that in most populations, the population average weight gain over 50 years is in excess of about 10 kilograms. And that sort of puts into perspective the target weight losses that were recommended in 2016 uh, by the American Endocrine Society and the American uh, societies that... Uh, were responsible for managing uh, uh, diabetes and other comorbidities. Uh, and very often in those guidelines, you'll see figures suggesting 10 to 15 kilograms weight loss. So maybe we can think of the proposed weight changes that we would like to see in present day uh, people with diabetes, a resetting of the weights to the earlier era. Also, perhaps we should not be so fearful of using lower energy and lower carbohydrate diets. And just a reminder that prior to the introduction of the agricultural revolution, uh, seven, 10,000 years ago in different parts of the world, um, that the diet of uh, human beings was probably a very energy restricted, very intermittent with probably many fast days uh, and was almost certainly a low carbohydrate diet. So with that, by way of background, uh, let's now go on to consider uh, what we uh, have evidence for in the 2020s. I'm also going to look at total diet replacement, comment on meal replacements, very briefly review the direct diabetes remission trial, the diadem study undertaken in the Middle East, and then summarize the position, but suggest some next steps. Um, so first of all, let's consider low and very low carbohydrate diets for type 2 diabetes. Now, there was a, uh, a very good, very extensive meta-analysis published in the British Medical Journal at the beginning of 2021, about two months ago, from which they selected 23 trials containing a total of 1357 participants, uh, looking at individuals who had um, used a low carbohydrate diet uh, compared to control diets in most cases of low fat diets. The duration is inevitably very variable, up to two years. But they concluded uh, that the um, clinically important improvements, improvements in weight loss and triglycerides uh, and insulin resistance occurred without adverse events. Uh, depending on the analysis, and of course there were lots of different analyses reported in the paper, the weight loss differences between the groups varied from 3.5 to 7.4 kilograms, indicating that using low carbohydrate diets and indeed even very low carbohydrate diets can actually be beneficial. And I think it's important at this stage to remember that we're not looking at all these different approaches to say, well, this one's better than that, or you, you should use this rather than that. Because I think we will in the future have to consider sequential um, therapies uh, and we might well be considering the use of, for example, total diet replacement followed by a low carbohydrate diet in the future. At the bottom there, I've just put a reminder of the actual absolute amounts of carbohydrate that we consider when we're looking at low and very low carbohydrate diets. So a low carbohydrate diet provides around just under 130 grams per day down to 30 and it's very low under 30. And then here's one of the uh, forest plots from that, which looked at HbA1c, showing on average that the ones where HbA1c was reported favor the experimental intervention. So compared with the mostly low fat control diets, um, they were associated with a large uh, increase in remission of diabetes. However, that was results at six months. Uh, there was limited amount of information at 12 months and very little beyond 12 months, and the benefits diminished at 12 months. So. This is very, very promising, but the indications are that we need some longer duration um, interventions uh, in order to be able to be certain of the benefit of this in the long term. And as you mentioned right at the beginning, Willie, there's a tremendous interest in ketogenic diets. And of course, these are diets in which the carbohydrate content is low in order to induce a state of ketogenesis, so high protein, high fat, low carbohydrate diets. And again, there was an, a, a good meta-analysis was reported last year uh, in which 14 studies were uh, analyzed, diets again varying in duration. Um, the energy intake from carbohydrate was 5 to 10%, so certainly one that would lead, ones that would lead to 
uh, high levels of blood ketones. The weight changes between the groups varied uh, 7.8 kilograms in those with type 2 diabetes and 3.8 overall because it was a mixture of studies on people with diabetes and those who had not yet developed diabetes and people who had, it didn't even have prediabetes. Um, and the group difference for HbA1c was 0.5% um, in diabetes, 0.42%. So overall, this uh, meta-analysis confirmed that ketogenics were more effective in improving metabolic parameters uh, than the standard diet. Um, so it looks promising. But I also note from the recently published uh, clinical practice guideline that was published in Malaysia, and that is that at the moment, it, it's not appropriate to make any recommendation in relation to ketogenic diets, because one has to be very careful about their use, and certainly to exclude uh, some groups of individuals. Uh, so for the time being, the recommendation uh, generally would be limited to potential use of low carbohydrate diets, not very low ketogenic diets. So I now want to turn to total diet replacement, and as Winnie has said, this has been one of my interests over the last 15 to 20 years. I think it's important to remember that while we're talking about diabetes today, that uh, all of these effective dietary weight interventions can be used in other obesity comorbidities, and I've been particularly interested in using them in people with osteoarthritis in our patients in the Arthritis Institute in Copenhagen. But just by way of background, let's just look at some definitions. As you all know, low energy diets are above 800 calories, uh, usually up to about 1200. And we don't usually go much above that. We'd use 1200 in, for example, preparation of bariatric patients before surgery. Very low energy diets below 800. But the key thing is, this is providing all food intake as formula product rather than as conventional food. Now, there are some food-based um, low energy diets. And I know that in Oxford, there's been an interest in using 800 to 1000 calorie diets from conventional food uh, with very good results. Um, but we here are considering those where we're just using the formula diet uh, intervention. These uh, diets are low in carbohydrate, but they are not very low. So 60 to 80 grams of carbohydrate in 600 to 800 calories per day, protein around 60 to 80 grams per day. Because they induce a larger energy deficit than the conventional um, dietary intervention, which would be about say five or 600 calorie deficit per day, you therefore get greater weight losses. And typically in European women, it would be 1.3 kilograms per week weight loss and an average of about 1.5 kilograms per week among men. Now, the interesting issue here is, of course, there are lots of ideas that people have uh, about formula diet from the past. And the first thing is that people say, well, surely people can't use this type of diet uh, for more than a few days. And when you look at that photograph I've placed in the top right there and you think that's all you're going to have uh, in one day, surely people will not manage to maintain this type of intervention for more than one or two days. The answer is surprisingly, and I know this from my own practice and we all know it from our various clinical trials, that compliance is actually very good once people get underway after a few days. And we do see high compliance. For example, in the preview uh, study on uh, prediabetes in eight countries, the compliance in the first eight week intervention with TDR, total diet replacement, was 91%. And that provides the best evidence we have so far that compliance is high. Now, it's interesting to ask the question, why is this so? Certainly, I can say that in conditions where the patient appreciates a benefit very quickly, such as in osteoarthritis, where the pain may disappear very quickly, and mobility may improve within a matter of weeks, people then become very motivated to continue the program. Of course, with metabolic disease, they may not necessarily feel any physical difference in terms of symptom change. But on the other hand, I think there's an important uh, issue that is important in diabetes, which is sleep. And we know that in specific sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, you can get very good improvement with big weight losses. What we don't have yet is the evidence from people who do not have specific sleep disorders, but hopefully this will come from Copenhagen shortly. But it is my general impression that even those who do not have specific sleep, sleep disorders do gain sleep benefit and feel very much better. And this I think helps to drive the compliance. Obviously the blood levels of the ketone bodies beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetic acid rise, and there is some evidence from Australia that this may well suppress the um, 
rise of ghrelin that occurs with energy restriction and that this may account for what we see which is an appetite suppression effect. Now I'm going to go immediately to describe very briefly a trial that many of you are already familiar with which is the diabetes remission trial that's been run in Newcastle in northern England and in Glasgow in southern Scotland. Uh, it was a cluster randomized study in, based on primary care that was done so that it would be immediately translatable into common usage. Um, the figures you see here, uh, the diets that we used or were used were the usual care or an 810 calorie total diet replacement delivered by healthcare uh, practitioners, usually the practice nurses, um, helped by and supervised by a, a team of dietitians using the Counterweight Plus dietitian led program, which was a program uh, of education and lifestyle modification uh, that was developed at um, Robert Gordon's. Um, University in Scotland originally. These patients were all non-insulin treated. Um, I just, as an aside, I'm not going to show you the slides, but there is a study on insulin treated, treated patients from Imperial College that was published last year that showed that this type of intervention can be given to insulin treated patients as well. But here they were diet or diet neural therapy only. Uh, they were followed initially for one year, then two years, and now uh, Diabetes UK, who has funded this study, has funded it through to five years. Five-year measurements are being made at the present time. We should perhaps see a preliminary presentation made maybe at the IDF meeting in December uh, for the five-year results and the paper in early 2022. Here are the one-year primary endpoint results. Um, the primary targets were set high, the weight loss one was certainly high at 15 kilograms, and you'll see that 24% of individuals managed that, whereas none in the NHS care group. But that did not mean the others didn't lose weight, of course, they lost varying amounts of weight, and you'll see that in just a moment. Remission of diabetes was 46% um, in the total diet replacement group, and six out of 149 in the usual care group. Uh, so overall, in total diet replacement group, they were 46% and then control 4% remissions. Uh, what you see here is the very clear um, illustration of the effect of the amount of weight loss and the proportion in remission, showing a rise through to 86% remission in those who'd achieved the 15 kilograms um, weight reduction and lesser amounts. If you pool all those over 10 kilograms, then you have 73% remission. So the key message is that if you can achieve a weight loss and maintain 10 kilograms weight loss at one year, three out of four of the individuals, bearing in mind these are people who had a diagnosis within the last six years, that these would be in remission. Of course, there were other effects as well. There was a great reduction of use of anti-diabetes medications. There's a blood pressure effect of this type of weight loss, which is quite appreciable, usually initially eight or even higher millimeters of mercury, maintaining perhaps three, four or five millimeters of mercury reduction through at the end of one year. So a reduction of blood pressure medication and an improvement in quality of life as measured by the EQ5 questionnaire. Uh, two years, uh, similar results were found. There was a little bit of drift away from the original results. So moving from 46 and 4% to 36% overall remission. But you'll see again the effect here of the um, relationship between the amount of weight loss, each of these columns here, the left one is the one year results, the right hand one is the two year results, showing that it maintained that same effect through to two years. Now, there's no report on the three year and four year results, we have to wait until early next year, or certainly by December, before we know what happens later on. But what we can say so far is that 10 kilograms weight loss maintained at two years gives diabetes remission in two out of three people. Now, a key thing I should say, of course, is that the total diet replacement is only used at the beginning of the program for, and in this case, it was 12 to 20 weeks. After that, food is reintroduced in steps and people are then passed onto conventional food, which is managed very tightly um, according to the guidelines that they have been given. Um, we introduced rec rescue packages so that if people gained weight, uh, they would uh, have an opportunity to reinforce their dietary program or even to use more meal replacements in order to um, lose a little bit of the weight that they had just regained. So we can say that this program sustained remissions for 24 months and Interestingly, it was related to the amount of sustained weight loss. Now, in the Newcastle cohort, Roy Taylor and his colleagues um, studied these individuals using MRI scanning. Uh, they defined a diabetes remission 
individuals, those who have diabetes remission as responders, and the others as non-responders. And what is interesting is that the responders lost more and regained less weight. The non-responders lost less and regained more weight. The liver scans, and I've pasted one of them up there, and you look at the top left image in one example there, there was 30.4% of the liver was uh, fat and after the weight loss down to 1.3%. This is interesting also because it reminds us that fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a, an increasing problem globally, leading to severe liver disease, fibrosis, and then indeed liver failure and requirement for transplant in some cases. Uh, and what we require really now is some very big randomized trials on the use of this type of intervention in patients with fatty liver disease. However, the interesting issue is that following this analysis, they were able to say that maintenance of remission was associated with more effective weight maintenance, more effective maintenance of the liver fat reduction, because those who maintained their uh, state of remission were those who also maintained their low liver fat. Those who did not maintain their remission, in those individuals, the liver fat uh, level rose back up a little. Uh, also, there were more pronounced rises of blood ketones and maintenance of blood ketone levels in those who were responders. So all of that helps us a great deal. And then I finally decided to put in this slide, which is a very recent one from October last year, because something very exciting has also been observed by Roy Taylor and his colleagues. They've also been able, and I, I do believe this is the first time anybody's been able to do this, to actually scan the pancreas and to measure the fat content in the pancreas. They've also measured pancreatic volume. And what you see here is an image from that paper, bearing in mind this is a subset of something of the order. I think it was a total of 90 individuals um, some of whom were responders, some who were not. And then there was a group of control uh, individuals. Um, the pancreas in individuals with type 2 diabetes is small, uh, irregular. So they were able to uh, look at the volume. And what they saw was that in responders, there was a gradual recovery over two years. There was no effect initially. So you have to, you have to maintain the state through to at least two years in order to demonstrate this effect. Uh, and then also, of course, there's an association uh, with the recovery of beta cell function that occurs as well. So this, this actually is very, very exciting and points the way for what we might be able to see and to achieve in the future. So to summarize, 10 kilogram weight loss delivered uh, diabetes remission in three out of four people at one year, uh, two out of three people at two years, responders lost most weight and regained less. That emphasizes for us that Achieving enough weight loss and managing to maintain it, which is a challenge, uh, is the really important thing. But we also know that rescue packages were needed by 50% of the uh, participants in that trial. Uh, it's interesting that in the United Kingdom uh, already, uh, NHS England is beginning to uh, look at rolling this out. There, there's a pilot trial of 5,000 individuals underway at the present time. But also in other parts of the world, the information that's already available is being used. And there is a diabetes remission service op offered at the Imperial College London Diabetes uh, Centre in Abu Dhabi. And to some extent, we are now able to say that this type of intervention uh, may be usable by individuals other than those of, of European origin, because of course all the work in the past has largely been done on Europeans. However, Shahad Tahiri last year published uh, his one-year results, the team's one-year results for a direct-like intervention in primary care undertaken in Qatar or on men and women of North African and Middle Eastern origin and showed very much the same uh, effects with a big weight reduction that you see here in the panel comparing the, to, uh, the total diet uh, intervention for 12 weeks, then food reintroduction and maintenance, comparing that with uh, seven, 77 individuals on the usual care program. And here you see the HbA1c results showing, again, the same sort of pattern. The remission rate at 12 months was 61% compared to 12%. I should add that in fact, in this study, the individuals had only had a diagnosis um, for three years, although it is possible that disease may have been more advanced by the time of diagnosis. And I put a note in the bottom right hand corner there to remind me that in the preview trial, there is some as yet unpublished evidence, but I've been told that the Pacific Island population in South Auckland who participated in the preview study of TDR in prediabetes 
were able to achieve weight losses during total diet replacement that were the same as in the Europeans. This is not yet published, but I've been advised that that's the case. And I think this helps us to understand that the issue of um, using this type of intervention in different groups around the world may not be as challenging as perhaps we thought it was, although we always have to make the intervention culturally appropriate. I, I decided last night that I would add in this slide, which I also think is very exciting because it's a proteomics study and proteomics is exciting, interesting. I think in five to 10 years time, when we see a new patient, we will get the proteomics profile that will tell us a pattern which will predict future disease in that individual. Uh, this is a study done by my colleagues in Copenhagen at the Parnham Institute, where individuals with no identified disease were, but who were obese, used an eight week, 800 calorie diet, uh, bloods were collected, um, 400 proteins were measured, and in the bottom left-hand panel, what you see is the change in BMI. The individuals were divided into those who had a high metabolic burden, in other words, higher levels of proteins marking um, insulin resistance and inflammation, and a low metabolic burden group. And then you see the panel on the right-hand side there showing the changes in the inflammatory markers, some of which are, of course, inflammatory signals that take place with the big initial weight loss, and then the maintenance of the reduced um, energy intake and the reduced low weight. And I think that's really exciting. And I hope that every future clinical trial in this area will include proteomics, because this will be used in the future, I'm absolutely certain. So to summarize, uh, against that background of rising prevalence of obesity and type 2 diabetes, we have low carbohydrate diets for which we now have evidence that they are effective, and uh, but we need some longer term trials. For total diet replacement, we now have studies that show their application in diabetes and other obesity related conditions. Uh, we have four year maintenance evidence from the osteoarthritis trial in Copenhagen. We have two year evidence from the direct trial. Uh, we will shortly be gaining the five year evidence. Uh, we know that this type of intervention, total heart replacement, achieves fast weight loss of 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms per week, and that this is highly motivating. We know from various studies, and uh, Susan Jeb in a moment will describe a study uh, in primary care, undertaken in primary care in a link with the community setting. We know that these can be delivered in different settings, and that's very important from a practical point of view. We know also that uh, these are cost effective, studies have been done, compliance is high, safety profile is good, and that we can reduce medication costs. Uh, there's a requirement to address educational needs. And finally, there are next steps. There's always more to do, and we need to characterize responders and non-responders more. Uh, we need to recognize the physiological and behavioral differences between them. We know, for example, from studies done in Glasgow that low baseline GLP-1 is associated with uh, greater difficulty with maintaining weight. We also need to have programs that are culturally appropriate. We need to design the best rescue packages and perhaps consider intermittent meal replacement products. And also we need to define as a result of experimental work, the optimal protein content, the amount of amino acid profile and so on, and also to, to determine whether or not glycemic index and glycemic load are really important. I think they probably are. There will be a little bit more evidence from the preview study shortly. And also to look at specific components we can use in diet, like inulin propionate, which may have a specific satiety effect. So I think that's all I have to say this morning. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Leeds. I think you've done a fantastic job trying to put all that data in in 20 minutes, right? I think, I, I think it's very clear to all of us. And thank you for clarifying that. Perhaps looking at the evidence, it looks like total diet replacement has the longest data that we can use for diabetes remission and uh, for giving us that heads up that we'll have the five-year data coming up, hopefully at the next mm -hmm. IDF. Um, and also, uh, I think it's interesting that you've highlighted people are looking at the mechanistic uh, you know, effects of diet replacement with the pancreas, with the, with, you know, the fat in, uh, reduction in the liver and also the proteomics with the inflammation. I guess some of the questions have started coming in, like, is this going to be ac applicable to a Malaysian sort of setting? Because uh, as you've pointed out, but you've pointed out in the Middle East that that's not the Caucasian population and we seem to have worked as well. So mm -hmm. I, I think you've, you've, it's triggered a lot of questions. So 
just so let's all be patient and let me just move on now. Thank you so yeah, much, Dr. Leeds. Thank you. Thank you. From Dr. Professor Susan Jepps next, going even deeper into this aspects of diet and diabetes remission. I'm very happy to um, introduce Professor Susan Jepps. She's a professor of diet and population health at the Nuffield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences at the University of Oxford. If you know, at the NHS, um, they have already rolled out a program um, based on the direct trial. And I think Prof. Susan has also contributed to those uh, evidence and she will be sharing that with us. But uh, also, I'm very impressed with the CV. Um, it's very difficult to summarize all of that in one or two minutes, Prof. Susan, all your achievements. But I'd like to mention that, first of all, um, Prof. Susan is actually an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, and that was appointed to her in 2019. And us working in nutrition science is like, how do you do that? So I'm going to have to follow your footsteps, Prof. Susan. <laughs> and she's also, of course, the fellow of the Academy uh, of Medical Sciences. She's a senior investor at the NIHR and a member of the UK Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. Um, Prof. Susan's research interest is about um, how what we eat affects our health and how we might change dietary habits to prevent and treat diet-related diseases. She's very interested in how scientific evidence actually can be translated into policy and practice by government, industry, public health community, and the media. And again, this is, of course, of great interest to us on how do we scale of this evidence for us to be able to implement it uh, at a nationwide uh, uh, scale. Um, Prof. Susan has got very impressive uh, roles that she has played in the UK, chairing expert advisory committee on obesity, responsible deal food network, member of the Public Health England Obesity Programme Board and advisory boards for the NHS England on um, you know, matters relating to interventions to prevent and treat type 2 diabetes. So I think, Prof. Susan, we all look forward now. It is yours. Thank you very much, Winnie, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you, at least online today, and I'm only very sorry that i uh, not able to be uh, in Malaysia with you in person. So thank you for asking me to talk today about some of the work that we've been doing in Oxford over the last five or 10 years. And um, all of this has been done in, in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Professor Aviard, who's going to speak in, in just a moment. Um, we know that uh, increases in body mass index are related to an increased risk of diabetes. And indeed, uh, around 90% of the patients that we see with type 2 diabetes are also overweight. But what's much more important is that weight loss can lead to remission from diabetes. And this is a slide that you are now very familiar with after Professor Leeds' uh, presentation. This is the results from the direct trial. And what I, the point that I want to make here is that there is a linear relationship between weight loss and the likelihood of achieving remission. So of course, we tend to focus on the statistic that Professor Leeds told us that people who lose more than 10% of their body weight have about a 75% um, uh, uh, chance of going into remission, but even people who lose only uh, five kilos, actually a small proportion of them will be successful. And so if we think of this at a population level, the, the basic fact we need to hang on to is that more people losing more weight is going to put more people into remission. Although total diet replacements are extremely effective, they're not going to be suitable for everybody. So it's really important that we keep in our minds that there are a range of different ways that we can support people to lose weight. So for the last uh, 10 years or perhaps even more, we've been working hard on this topic and we've published a number of systematic reviews which have tried to synthesize all of the literature from um, around the world on the effectiveness of interventions for weight loss. And you can uh, look up some of those references later if you're interested. I'm just going to skim through some of the highlights in this uh, short talk. I want to start by saying that encouraging people simply to try to manage their weight themselves is modestly effective. Um, it's definitely worth encouraging people to think about their weight. 
Um, it's not hugely effective. You can see at the bottom from our review of self-help interventions that the weight loss is quite limited. But nonetheless, if the whole population was to do this, you can begin to imagine the benefits that would accrue from that. And just uh, last summer in the UK, the uh, NHS launched a new uh, weight loss app, which is free for everybody. You can download it, I guess, even in, in Malaysia, um, which gives people the very basic um, information and tools that might help them to succeed. So this can be done essentially at, at, at minimal cost. But what we know is that if people receive support in their weight loss attempt, they are likely to be much more effective. And in our review of behavioral weight management interventions, what was clear is that there was a subgroup of interventions which involved referring people to community weight loss groups. And these were often run by commercial providers, companies like, like Weight Watchers that you perhaps are familiar with. But these sorts of community groups do seem to offer people uh, a much better chance of losing more weight than doing it alone. And so what you hit, see here is the data from that systematic review a few years ago. And on average, and this was at one year, even though most of these interventions will have been much shorter than that, but following people up at one year, the uh, weight loss was more than two kilos greater than control. And the control groups typically lost um, uh, more than a kilo. So people are losing more than three kilograms at one year. Now, of course, that's the mean. And within that, some people will lose a great deal more. So here's one particular trial, which is uh, one we ran uh, in Oxford, in Cambridge, and also up in the north of England in Liverpool. So it was a big multi-centre trial. What we did here was to... Uh, randomized people who were living with obesity to one of three intervention groups. In the orange line, you see the so-called brief intervention, which was um, uh, 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 a written information to support people to lose weight. So essentially self-help. And then the other two groups involved referral to a commercial weight loss program. In the 12 week group, people, as, as the title suggests, were able to attend the group for just 12 weeks or three months. And in the 12 month group, people were able to attend the program as often as they wished for a whole year. And we then followed people up again at 24 months. So they've now had um, at least a year, if not more, with no intervention. What you can see is that people referred to the weight loss groups do very much better. And that longer referrals bring greater weight loss. Me loss in people who were released for 12 months was almost seven kilograms. If we look here at how many people lost more than 10% of their body weight, you can see that one in six people referred to the community weight loss program for one year lost uh, more than 10% of their body weight. And so as we've heard from Tony, that would be expected to give them a very considerable chance of putting their diabetes into remission. This trial was con wasn't conducted in people with diabetes, but there's no reason to imagine that the results would be different. In the UK, we're now rolling out these sorts of programs involving referral to weight loss groups as part of our National Diabetes Prevention Program. So this has now been uh, made available to more than half a million people right across the country. And so what you see here is the data from really genuine routine rollout. On average, the weight loss was about 2.7%. But unsurprisingly, as you can see, the more sessions that people attend, the more successful they are. And this greater weight loss is also associated with a greater reduction in HbA1c. And why I think that this, this data matters is it demonstrates to us that actually these uh, weight losses that are achieved within the trials are really quite robust and can be rolled out in usual care. And we're seeing a great expansion in the UK in the number of organisations and companies that are able to provide these sorts of programmes. They've now expanded, they're not just in groups, but they're also done uh, sometimes, uh, not only in groups in person, but of course, partly because of the pandemic, although it was happening before anyway, 
also uh, done remotely and indeed some which are done through, uh, through apps and other, other digital uh, methods. Now we've heard a lot already uh, today about total diet replacement and I just want to briefly mention that again because without doubt more weight loss is going to be better and for people who are willing to uh, have a go at total diet replacement we know that this can be very successful. So typically in these programmes, people are asked to replace all of their usual food with specially formulated soups, shakes and bars, which are nutritionally complete, but which have only around about 800 or 900 calories a day. And this is typically for eight to 12 weeks. So the data that we've been reporting is the results at one or two years from, from baseline, but actually the period of total diet replacement is relatively short. After that, there's a period of gradual food reintroduction and of course, regular behavioral support to motivate people to stick to the program in the first place, but particularly to help them return um, to a healthier eating plan afterwards. At the same time that the direct trial was being run in the north of England, we set up a trial in Oxford, uh, which was called the Droplet Study. And the uh, important thing to note about Droplet is that this recruited people who were, um, uh, had a body mass index greater than 30, they were living with obesity, but they had no particular comorbidity. And this was partly because there was a sense that um, only people with diabetes would be able to, to stick to the rigors of this diet. And we wanted to see if it was more generally applicable. But also, unlike direct, where all the treatment occurred within the practice by practice nurses or dietitians, what we wanted to do was to see whether the primary care team would identify patients and then refer them to a company who would help help and support people uh, to lose weight, knowing that that might be a uh, more viable option for the, the health service, because we simply don't have en enough nurses and dietitians to go round to give everybody with diabetes the opportunity to have such intensive support as they received in direct. So what we did in the droplet trial was randomize people to one of two groups. Uh, one group received usual care with advice to lose weight from their practice nurse. And the second group, the total diet replacement group, were referred to a commercial provider, the Cambridge Weight Plan, uh, to support them in their weight loss attempt. And here you see the results. During the six months of active intervention, people in the total diet replacement group lost 15 kilograms on average. We didn't see them again after that, so they were left to their own devices and there was some weight regain, but nonetheless, at 12 months, people were still 10 kilograms lighter. And this weight change is almost identical to that which was seen in the direct programme. Importantly, 45% of people who were in the total diet replacement group lost more than 10% uh, of their initial body weight uh, and far, far fewer people in the, uh, in the nurse led group, the usual care group achieved this amount. Now, Total diet replacement's great. I'm, I'm uh, very keen that people who want to try this approach should have the opportunity to do so. But the reality is that it is quite expensive. It's expensive because the products are specially formulated, they're nutritionally complete, and so they're quite costly. Um, but also, of course, there's considerable behavioral support which goes alongside it. So in direct, it was estimated that the total cost of the program was around 1,200 pounds. And I apologize because I should have converted that in, in, into Malaysian currency. Um, whereas in our droplet trial, where the um, support was provided remotely and not by health professionals, it was a little bit cheaper, so just over £800 uh, per, per year. But people, firstly, are, the health service is concerned about the cost, but many patients are also um, unattracted by the idea of having soups and shakes. There are people, believe it or not, who like eating real food. And so we're constantly asked, well, can I do this with a real food, uh, a real food diet? Could we achieve similar results? 
Now, in the past, as uh, dietitians, we've often tried to counsel people to uh, consume low energy diets, but that's been quite difficult to get people down to intakes of around about the 800 calories that can be achieved with total diet replacements. But recently, there's been particular interest in whether we could do that by using essentially a low energy, low carbohydrate diet. And so we have uh, last year completed a, 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 a feasibility study to see whether this might be a practical option, whether there was any signs of early effectiveness. This is the so-called Diamond Programme, which was led uh, by uh, one of our, our PhD students, uh, Elizabeth Morris. So what Diamond involved were four basic uh, elements. It was about low energy. We were aiming to get people to reduce their energy intake to 800 to 1,000 calories a day. To predominantly do that by cutting out carbohydrates. That was all of the biscuits, cakes, chocolate and confectionery, but also the staple foods like bread, pasta and rice. And instead to focus their diet around fresh, healthy foods with plenty of fruits and vegetables. And there was a behavioural support programme. It involved one meeting, just 10 minutes with their family doctor, and then four appointments with the practice nurse. So that totaled about uh, just over an hour of contact time. As I said, it was a very small feasibility trial um, and just lasted 12 weeks with 33 patients. But the results were remarkable, certainly much more effective than we had envisaged uh, when we started. This is, I have to say, the first time we've seen uh, practice nurses able to support people to lose quite so much weight loss. In the intervention group, the average weight loss was 10 kilograms, and that was accompanied by a very dramatic reduction in HbA1c. And you can see that although the control group lost a little bit of weight, um, actually it was very much uh, smaller. Now, obviously, this is only at 12 weeks and we need to follow people up for longer. And in the next month, we'll be starting that longer, longer term trial. But nonetheless, I do think there is um, real interest and promise in this approach. I think it partly works because the dietary advice is very simple. There isn't a whole mass of rules to follow. It's simply about cutting out uh, carbohydrates, at least for the first 12 weeks. In the longer term study, we'll gradually reintroduce small amounts of carbohydrate to the diet to create a weight maintenance program. But firstly, small, limited amounts of carbohydrate and with the emphasis on the high fiber varieties, because we know that actually dietary fiber is helpful for people uh, with diabetes. So the key question, I've now shown you that we have multiple ways to help people lose weight and there will, it is likely, be one approach which does suit most of our, most of our patients. The challenge is really, can we embed weight management into routine care? We heard at the start of, uh, of this session uh, that lifestyle modification is recommended in all the clinical guidelines, but the concern is that it's not really happening and that perhaps uh, physicians uh, pass over that step rather quickly and move, move uh, rapidly to pharmacotherapy. So we have tried to do this by training doctors to make a very brief intervention in primary care. And this was a trial led by my colleague, Professor Aviard. Very briefly, we trained them to raise the topic of weight opportunistically at the end of a routine consultation in a very brief intervention, which lasted literally 30 seconds. We were delighted again by the results of this because with just a 30 second intervention, 40% of patients accepted the offer of a referral to a program and actually turned up. In fact, about three quarters said, yes, doctor, I'll do that. But the, but the important thing is that 40% of them actually attended the weight management program. They went on to be very successful, losing two and a half kilograms, and 25% of them lost more than 5% of their initial body weight. Now, many doctors say to us that they're concerned or anxious about raising what is 
often perceived to be a very sensitive topic. And so it's very reassuring to know that four out of five of patients in this trial, and this was a trial of nearly 2000 people, but four out of five of the patients said that the conversation with their doctor was appropriate and helpful to them. And so what we'd like to do is to encourage far more doctors to be uh, willing and able to raise the issue with their patients and then to refer them to an effective service. Here we referred them to a community weight loss group and the results were very similar to what we would expect uh, from patients who choose to go to these services themselves. And you could of course envisage that people might be referred to a total diet replacement program instead. The principle is that doctors can raise the issue in primary care uh, briefly, effectively, and in a supportive way. The key is that services are in place so that patients can then be referred to an effective intervention. Now, one of the secrets, if, there is, if it can be described like that, but certainly one of the important things about raising the issue in routine consultations is to do that in a sensitive and an appropriate way. And we've become increasingly conscious of how crucial the language is that we use in these discussions. And Charlotte Albury, who is also his postdoc in our team, has been working very hard on this by analyzing in detail the conversations that doctors have with their patients. And she's produced both an academic paper, which talks about this work, but also a, um, a, a guide which was produced in combination with one of our patient support groups in the UK uh, called Language Matters. And both of those are available on the web. So over the last 10 years, we've spent a lot of time uh, working on these research projects. And I'm really delighted that over the last year, we've really seen these start to move into uh, everyday practice. So um, I've already mentioned the National Diabetes Prevention Programme, which has been running for a couple of years now, offering referral to community weight loss groups or now to digital interventions. But we've got a pilot programme, uh, a national pilot of 5,000 patients who are being offered total diet replacements with the specific aim of inducing remission of their type 2 diabetes. And just next month, there is a new program uh, about to launch, which will encourage GPs using financial incentives to um, offer weight loss in routine primary care for people um, who are living with obesity, but who also have diabetes or hypertension. And I think this is a real recognition that we can make a very positive difference um, uh, to the lives of people at risk of diabetes or living with diabetes. And, and I haven't had time to talk about it today, these interventions are very cost effective. Indeed, some of the cheaper interventions may actually be cost saving for the NHS or for, for healthcare systems, because treating obesity today is actually about preventing more complex disease, preventing diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease in later life. So just uh, to summarize, um, what I hope I have uh, um, uh, shown you today is that even just encouraging patients to self-manage their weight is likely to be helpful. It's important to use appropriate language. And we really encourage doctors to practice their scripts, learn, learn a, a little 30 second sequence that's, that you can say to your patients. So it becomes a routine component of your diabetes care. Referring people to structured programs is going to lead to greater weight loss than leaving people to do it themselves. And as long as these programs are evidence-based and have been shown to be effective, those which are relatively inexpensive are likely in fact to be cost-saving. Total diet replacement programs do, are, are the best way to achieve the greatest weight loss. However, they're only going to be suitable for a proportion of patients who are willing to give these a go. Around about 20% of the population um, uh, took up this offer in the direct trial. The fact that there is a realistic probability of remission, certainly for patients who are reasonably newly diagnosed with diabetes, is likely to make these a very, very cost effective um, option for people with diabetes. 
And finally, though, I want to, to say that obesity is a chronic relapsing condition. And so after all of these interventions, we do see that on average, people regain weight. And we need to recognize that some people may need repeated interventions to help them to manage their weight in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, that was a very presentation. Thank you for sharing with us all the work that you've done at Oxford. Um, especially interesting with the diamond study, because we're getting comments that this is your low carbohydrate options and switching them to a more lower glycemic index and healthier diet that we see. So really looking forward to more data coming out from there. And also thank you for sharing on how you can translate that to primary care. Um, I think there's questions coming up now about how do we get this structured program rolled out. Um, and also changing the way we talk to our patients. I think that is, again, a very important message that you have shared. Um, I, there, there, there are questions related to that, so we'll come back to you, Susan. So thank you so much for your presentation. I will now move on to our, our last but not our least speaker, and the, she is uh, Susan's colleague, that's Professor Paul Eviat, and I'm happy to introduce Professor Paul, who, will, who is a practicing GP and a professor of behavioral medicine at the University of Oxford. And his research is focusing on Health and primary care. Um, he, he does a lot of work on tobacco control and weight control. Um, and also um, he focuses on clinical trials and supporting systematic reviews and qualitative studies. I think Paul is going to share with us um, a very important aspect of all what is the impact of all this weight loss in the long term, especially for um, cardiovascular risk. So Paul, over to you. Jolly good. And I hope you can now see my slides. Is that true? Yes, yes, we can. Brilliant. So, of course, the biggest risk factor for people with type 2 diabetes is long term cardiovascular disease. And my talk, I'm going to try to understand or look at what we know about what we've seen as the short term impact of these weight loss programs on cardiovascular risk on cardiovascular disease. Now, um, let me just go on. Right. So uh, just to say, uh, I worked on the droplet study that Susan presented, which was funded by Cambridge Weight Plan. Now, I don't know what people feel about weight loss in your countries, but in Britain, the mood about weight loss is pretty negative. So uh, people will say yes, uh, as we've shown, and as we've shown you repeatedly in, in, in the course of this symposium, people can lose weight. But what's the point? Because they just put it back on. Uh, and there's a, a common perception in Britain, for example, that dieting makes you fat. In other words, you put on even more weight after you lose weight than would have been the case if you had never tried to lose weight in the first place. So um, the question that I want to ask here is, first of all, is that true? And secondly, even if the weight loss isn't uh, if the weight loss is temporary, what would be the effect on long term cardiovascular risk or even of a temporary weight loss? Now, if we're to try to understand this, we need to go back a step and think first about why it is that uh, being overweight or having obesity causes people to die early. Uh, and this is from a very large study. Uh, it was coordinated by colleagues in Oxford, but it's, it's called the Prospective Studies Collaboration. It's about a million people, and they were followed over many years, and they were measured at baseline. And what we're seeing in this graph on the x-axis is the body mass index going up from 20 up to about 50 on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it's cardiovascular mortality. And what you can see is a very clear straight line relationship between higher BMI and higher cardiovascular risk, risk of death from cardiovascular disease with a nadir at around 22. So more, more fat, more risk. Now, the question is, why does that occur? And the answer is mostly explained by these two graphs which is the same data again, this time looking at the cardiovascular risk factors of blood pressure and lipid profile. And you see the same kind of straight line relationship between increasing BMI and higher blood pressure and increasing BMI and higher or adverse blood lipid profile. 
And the bit of cardiovascular risk that's not explained by blood pressure and by lipids is explained by uh, glycemia and the risk of developing diabetes. So that's why having obesity is bad for us, or indeed having too much fat. It doesn't matter whether we're officially classified as obese or not. The higher the fat level, the, the higher the risk. Now, those were cross-sectional studies, and um, in the sense that weight was measured at baseline, and then we waited 20, 30 years for uh, people to uh, have an outcome of cardiovascular disease or not. Um, that's what happened in those studies. But here we're looking at relatively shorter term studies, but what happens when people change their weight? Our graph suggested that putting on weight or reducing weight would make a difference to risk, but it didn't show it. It just looked at cross-sectionally. What we're seeing here is studies where weight change, and that's what's on the x-axis, weight change. And on the y-axis, we're seeing, in this case, lipid fraction changes. And I circled the one in red is LDL as the sort of risk marker, if you like, for cardiovascular disease. And the blue lines here are the null, are the sort of zero axis. So zero weight change and zero LDL change is where the lines cross. And what you can see is that as weight changes, LDL changes in that same kind of straight line relationship that we saw in that previous, as it were, cross-sectional analysis. The same is true of blood pressure. But the same sort of graph here, lines, the blue lines go through the zero points. And we see as weight changes, blood pressure changes. And more, most helpfully of all, as weight goes down, blood pressure goes down. Something like here, about half to one millimeter of mercury reduction for each kilo weight loss. So we see a nice reduction in risk. So what weight loss does then is what we would have expected it to do, which is put blood pressure down, improve lipids and reduce glycemia. I haven't shown you glycemia, but you understand that that's so. If weight loss is temporary, you will therefore experience a temporary reduction in blood pressure and a temporary improvement in lipid profile and a temporary um, improvement in glycemia. What difference will that make? And here's a study that will give us some clue that this could be important for cardiovascular risk prevention. This is a, one of the very early statin trials. It's a famous trial called WASCOPS done in Scotland. And um, what happened in this trial was people were randomized to get either placebo or pravastatin for uh, up to five years. And the blue line on my graph, the vertical blue line, is the point at which, where the randomization was broken and the results of the trial was declared. Now, uh, what's important here, because this is now an observational analysis after the end of the blue line, is that people who were allocated to pravastatin stopped it, and people who were allocated to placebo started statins. And so from the point of the blue line onwards, the prevalence of use of, of pravastatin or other statins was the same in the placebo and pravastatin arm. And because we can be confident randomization disputed cardiovascular risk equally between arms, from the point of the blue line onwards, we can see that the lipid profile of these people would have been the same in the placebo arm and the statin arm. But what's really important here is that what you see is that the mortality, uh, the cardiovascular risk remains different from that point onwards, and in fact, slightly widens. So in other words, we had a temporary reduction of lipids in this point to five years, and then from five years through to 20 years, we had a reduction in the risk of mortality that was as a result of what had happened earlier. It's the so-called legacy effect. And the question we wanted to ask, and we did a very large systematic review I'll tell you about now, was can we see this legacy effect on, uh, of a temporary, potentially, reduction in weight 
uh, on cardiovascular risk in the future. But first of all, we wanted, of course, to understand what happens to weight. How quickly is, does weight go back on? And as it were, does it overshoot, as we saw in uh, the, the, those graphs that I put up at the beginning? So we included in our review randomized trials of people with obesity who, or who were overweight they, who received a behavioral weight loss program. This wasn't a, a dietary or surgical program. And we, there was a variety of comparators, but they were all taken into account in the analysis. And the key thing in our, to make it into our review was that studies had to measure weight not only at program end, but after the program had finished. So in other words, the weight loss program might last, for example, in droplet, it lasted six months, for example, but we follow people to a year. Uh, so any, pro any study that followed people for longer than a year where the program uh, lasted only for a short time in that follow-up was included. Now, um, what we did was a whole variety of different ways of analyzing the data. We also looked at why people were regaining weight. Was it something about the programs that they had been on? And we looked at the cost effectiveness, but I won't talk about that today. There was an awful lot of uh, work went into this review because of an awful lot of behavioral weight management trials. In the end, we were able to use data from 250 trials, uh, or just short of 250 trials, with just short of 60,000 people in the trial. The average length of follow-up in our trials that we used was uh, two years, um, but the longest lasted uh, 30 years. So, but anything from a, a, a beyond a year to uh, up to 30 years. Now, let me talk you through these graphs because you're going to see a few of them just to, so you get your eye in. So what we're looking at here is each blob is an estimate from a single study. And the size of the blob on the graph is, represents the amount of data, usually the number of, of participants in the study. Um, and we're looking at the difference between intervention and control. So uh, here, the naught line is this dashed line across here. That line represents there is no difference between intervention and control. In other words, whatever happened in the behavioral weight loss program, once it gets to zero, the effect has gone away. Anything on the downside of this implies the weight loss program, in this case it's weight, is uh, the weight is lower in the people who got the weight loss program compared with people who did not or got a lower intensity weight loss program. And these lines represent different ways of analyzing the data that are not that important here because uh, we, we, there's no single best way to do this. Each way has limitations. And I'm going to show you three ways on here just to show, I hope, convince you that what we're not doing here is, as it were, fiddling with the data. So here are our 250 or so studies with all their various estimates. And these lines represent uh, a, a so-called meta-regression line, which puts a line through each study estimate. This is a random effects line, uh, a, a different way of analyzing the data. And on the right-hand side, we see a survival curve. Here, when the curve drops as each intervention reaches the same point as the control in follow-up. And what's important here is the length of this x-axis. This is in months. And what you're looking at here is a, a, an x-axis that runs out to 10 years on this side, um, my zoom things in the way, it's running out to 30 years. And each of these estimates suggest that intervention, the intervention groups remain at a lower weight than control for at least five years, maybe as long as 10 years. We don't know because the data gets very sparse as we get out to the right hand end, but there appears to be a benefit that is lasting for about five years on weight gain. So let's just take that for now, that perhaps this is a five year benefit on weight. What we're going to look at now is what difference that makes to cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and also on cardiovascular risk factors. Do they also show, show the same 
five-year benefit. So uh, this is incidence of cardiovascular disease. There were not many um, studies that measured cardiovascular disease in weight management programs, but the sort of obvious reason really that um, uh, there are so few people develop cardiovascular disease over the short term that for any one study, it seems not worth the trouble of collecting it. This is incidence of diabetes. And again, as in the previous graph, you can see that the, here's the zero line. This was where intervention and control would be the same. And we see that because this, the dots and the lines are below the zero line, it implies a benefit of intervention over control for as long as the data lasts. So in other words, we don't know what happens in the long term, but it appears to be lasting at least 10 years here on incidence of diabetes. This is the effects on cardiovascular risk factors now. And again, we can see that the, the blobs are mostly below the zero line. In other words, intervention is beating control on improved lipid profile. And these lines again are going out to five years or more. Um, we don't know really what happens beyond five years because there's almost no data at this end of the line, but we see a benefit on average across these weight loss programs that's lasting nearly five years. This is glycemia. So measures of, for example, HbA1c or fasting or uh, random glycemia were used here in this analysis. And again, you see that there's a benefit that's lasting at least five years on glycemia. This is blood pressure. These lines this is about five years at this zero point where the lines cross, but we can't really say where that effect on blood pressure goes to because all the data is at this left-hand end. But the point is that on average, a behavioral weight loss program lowers blood pressure and lowers it for several years um, after, after the program finishes. One of the things that people worry about, of course, is that if we put people on a weight loss program and they uh, go off and lose weight and then they put it back on, that people will be disappointed and their quality of life will suffer. Uh, and that, that may be so, but the data does not support that. Here we're looking now out uh, at um, eight years or so before these lines on quality of life cross. Now, because quality of life is a positive attribute, benefits of weight loss program are shown on the north side of this zero line. So in other words, uh, we see a bigger improvement in quality of life or the quality of life improves in the intervention compared with the control. And that effect is lasting for several years. I won't talk very much about why uh, some programs have faster weight regain than others, except to say this very particular thing, which is the more pe weight people lose in a weight loss program, the faster they regain weight. And that's a key point. So uh, our estimate is that for every kilo a person loses, they regain weight at somewhere between 0.13 and 0.19 kilograms per year faster. Now, that's an important thing because you think, oh, well, slow weight gain is a slow weight loss is obviously better. But that's not really what we're saying. If you think about it, in order to if you lose an extra kilo in a weight loss program, then it's going to take you over five years for that weight, the extra weight that you lost to have disappeared. So it's the same sort of five year time scale that seems to be running through all of the data in our analysis that you get a five-year benefit. So programs with greater weight loss lead to longer time below the control group, lasting at least five years. Meal replacement programs, which typically, as you've seen, or uh, in, we call them meal replacements, but total diet replacement programs, typically lead to faster and greater weight loss, and so had typically greater weight regain. But that effect, as I said, is explained because they're leading to greater weight loss. And once you control for the amount of weight that people lose, the, the, as it were, the harm, if you like, or the, the worst weight regain from meal replacements disappears. But 
it's so important to remember that greater weight loss leads to uh, lower weight over at least five years. And that's that graph shown. So just a couple of things to remember. Uh, first off, um, these data are unpublished, not gone through peer review. Secondly, there's a lot of differences between uh, pro weight loss programs that we studied that we can't explain. And this is partly in differences in the amount of weight loss, for example. Some programs didn't, lose to an, didn't lead to any significant weight loss, but they're still in our analysis. And we don't really know what's going on beyond five years. But what we can say is that there is a benefit of a weight loss program, not only to weight, but to all our cardiovascular risk factors. And in so far as we can tell with the data in the incidence of diabetes and in the incidence of cardiovascular disease that lasts for about five years. Um, and I just wanted to end with one slide, which is one particular program, which I think shows this very clearly in a, in a very simple way. This is the very famous study, the Diabetes Prevention Program in, uh, done in America, where weight loss, the weight loss program led to about six kilos of weight loss during the first year with slow weight regain thereafter and trending back towards the control group, which is shown in blue. And what's really crucial here is that the follow-up over 10 years shows that the incidence of diabetes remains lower for at least 10 years. They've now followed for 15 years, and that graph will looks the same at 15 years. So you, you've deferred diabetes into the future. So all of the data that we have suggests that there is this clear legacy effect that weight loss may be temporary, it lasts for the benefits of a weight loss program lasts for several years, probably over five years. And that leads to potentially temporary reductions in cardiovascular risk factors. But that appears to lead to permanent reductions in the incidence of cardiovascular disease. And of course, that makes sense when we think about the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. It's a process of gradual accumulation of atheromatous plaques in our arteries. So I hope that's some encouragement that our efforts, while they may have some degree of temperiness to them, will still benefit our patients in the long term. And that's all I want to say. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Paul. I think you have convinced us that it's worth that pain of you know, losing that weight. And even though the weight creeps up, there's still benefit and that legacy effect that you emphasize mm -hmm. so much. And thanks for sharing with us data that you know, I think we have the very first few to have a glimpse into your analysis that you have done. That's going to be something that will, will be highly quoted, I'm sure. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, fantastic talk that we've had. I've got a lot of WhatsApp coming in saying, great talk. Um, we really learned a lot. But we now come to the last few minutes, which is the uh, questions. And I really thank that you can see in the Q&A, um, Prof. Susan has been great. She's been answering questions already over there. I see Dr. Zanaria has already started answering questions as well. So I think for those of you who asked all these questions, uh, you can check the answers over there. But still, I think there are a few important ones that I'd like to bring up that we'll get comments from everyone in the panel. The first thing is, let's talk about the, the remission aspects of it. Um, there's lots of questions on uh, safety. So um, maybe for Dr. Leeds, there's a question about the keto diet and perhaps with Dr. Zanaria as well, is it safe for people with diabetes? And there's also a question of hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes, if we, they were to follow these low calorie diets of 800 calorie diets, for example, and if there's hunger. So maybe I'll just open this to this, this aspects about safety to everyone to comment. Um, it, it, with regard the first to one is about ketogenic, yeah. Yes. Um, my understanding from the guideline that you published at the end of January was that you are not actually recommending that these be used at the moment because there's insufficient evidence and that there are subgroups of people with diabetes who certainly shouldn't use them. Is that right, Dr. Samaria? Yes, yes. I think we have to be very careful, especially yeah. those on insulin therapy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as you understand, you know, one in three patients in primary care are on insulin, and I think about three quarters in hospital-based care are on insulin. So yeah. using a ketogenic diet is with caution. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. 
There was also a question. That, um, uh, we have these new uh, agents called the SGLT2 inhibitors, mm -hmm. which are really making it a big, you know, because of their mm -hmm. cardiac and renal so protective benefits. And we've yeah. had patients going on a keto diet and coming in with yeah. diabetic keto acidosis. That's right. I think the problem is they don't check with us, right? When they, when they, they, go, they listen to social media and they think it's a yeah. good thing to try. And I think the message to educate our patients not to try these diets and unless you from the doctor is very important. Um, what about if you're on... Uh, so sorry, Dr. Leeds, you were going to add and I was something. just going to say, there was also a question about medication and, and That's how right. to change medication. Yeah. So can I just point out that uh, Paul and Susan have placed uh, pages of information on the website of the Primary Care Sciences Department in Oxford. Do you want to comment on those, Susan and Paul? Mm -hmm. okay. so, uh, there's I mean, a question. Yeah. so there are pages that you've provided to help uh, yeah. So, yeah. So in, in direct trial, um, they stopped all medication. These were people with diabetes diagnosed within six years, not on insulin. Uh, and they stopped all medication at the start of the total diet replacement. In our trial and droplet, we had a rather more cautious approach, uh, which was um, stopping anything that could cause hypoglycemia, reducing blood pressure tablets, but not stopping completely we found our GPs were slightly more reluctant to stop medication because it goes against the grain. It doesn't feel natural or normal to do this. Um, but um, actually it, it direct showed it, it was safe and there was a reduced, um, reduced serious adverse events. So it's, that's a, diff a, a term defined by trialists, but it means admissions to hospital in the group who went on the total diet replacement mm -hmm. program. So it, it, it does appear to be a safe thing to do and it's an important thing to do. Our guidelines are available and um, we can make the link available. Mm -hmm. And would you like to comment about uh, the question about managing hunger when they're taking this low calorie, low carb diet? Maybe from Prof Susan? How do you manage hunger uh, in these patients? Uh, sorry, I was just trying to find the link to our guidelines, which oh, we'll okay, continue. yeah, we can. Um, put well, managing hunger. Um, I mean, this is a, this is a, a problem. Um, interestingly, on total diet replacement, um, people who really stick with the program actually, after a couple of days, tend not to report hunger. Seems mm. astonishing to those of us who've never had to do this. And that may be because it leads to a certain level of uh, ketones in, in the blood, which may have a satiety effect. Mm. But certainly, um, once people are established on a total diet replacement program, they do remarkably well. Now, there was a question in the chat about how can I get more people to do it? And I think my suggestion is encourage people to give it a try. It is not going to suit everybody. Um, some people will just find they can't manage without eating. It's too socially awkward. But a surprisingly large number of people find it works for them more mm. than imagine at the beginning. So mm. give it a try. Review after two weeks. And if you're not, if patients are not losing weight well at two weeks, then switch to something else. Because if you don't lose weight in the first two weeks, you're not suddenly going to start losing weight two months later. Yeah. So um, yeah. In, the managing hunger issue is, is, is less, you know, even in our diamond study where people were not having carbohydrates, actually they didn't report huge hunger. It, mm. but, but nonetheless, you do need, because there needs to be enough food to fill people up and more fiber is going to help. But um, yeah, there's no magic trick. Would you put more proteins into the diamond study? Do you, do you use proteins to add in well, hunger? Um, to some extent. I mean, when you're not having carbohydrate, then what you basically Thanks. get is a bit of sort of protein and some vegetables. But in mm. order to keep down to 800 calories, the portions, you know, even if you're meat or fish, are small. really, really small. I think the thing is that this is not for a lifetime. And one of the things is saying, actually, we're really going to go at this really dramatically for two or three months. We're going to marshal all of your energy and effort to do this very intensively. And at least for some people, that is easier than the prospect of having to diet forever. Um, and so they can just really, really focus on a short period of time. Mm. Um, and, you know, as Paul has said, the greater initial weight loss is the best predictor of long-term success. Mm -hmm. So um, we've really got to capitalize on that, on that early enthusiasm. That's right. There's also questions on um, this 10 kilogram weight loss. Um, is it, does it work for people shorter duration of diabetes? 
Does it work for people who have, you know, they are older, that's got diabetes longer? Um, that's one question. And there's also a question on whether, um, well, let's answer that one first. Like, you know, does it work for all people or all people with diabetes or only those with shorter durations? Um, the study that was published from Imperial College last year by mm -hmm. Brown and Gary Frost and so on, uh, studied people who'd had their diabetes for an average of 14 years. Uh, they were insulin treated. Uh, obviously, the, the scope for change was less, but they did gain metabolic benefit. Uh, I think at, at uh, the end of one year, 50% uh, of them had actually stopped using the insulin, showing that they were still producing endogenous insulin uh, and could be managed with oral agents and diet. So mm -hmm. that's a paper that's worth looking at. That's Brown. It was, I think it was published in January last year. Hasn't been followed up yet with a further long-term trial, but the evidence was one year results. So even in advanced diabetes, it can be beneficial. Man clinical management is more difficult in that group because you have to be very careful as you titrate the insulin down, yeah. starting with the soluble insulin and then going yeah. on to the longer insulin. But it, it's been done. So it's been done mm -hmm. experimentally and it's been done in practice in clinics in London and elsewhere as well. Yeah. Can be because, done. Yep. So Paul and Susan have shared the link for the medication adjustments. So please go there and take a look as well for the participants who are interested in that. Another interesting question is what if the diabetes patient is not overweight or obese? Does that mean it's never going to be in there? There's no chance of remission. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think Roy Taylor's doing a study to address that, isn't he, at the moment, Susan? Uh, yes, he is. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so, so we'll we'll wait and see. Of course, yeah. um, you know we know that uh, probably the optimal BMI for a Caucasian population is around about twenty two. It may be slightly lower than that for an Asian population. So, my mm -hmm. guess is that we could. Um, encourage even people who are in the, the so-called healthy weight range, probably losing a little bit of weight is probably going to be a good thing. Um, the other thing about low carbohydrate diets is that there appears to be an HbA1c lowering effect, which, which is independent of the weight loss. Mm -hmm. And so although most people with type two diabetes are overweight, those who aren't are increasingly saying to us, what can I do? And I think we'll see more studies and more research in this area. Mm -hmm. Another point that perhaps for, uh, to, as we close the session is to maybe questions to Dr. Zanaria about how do we get governments to be more aware about you know, the need for lifestyle for pre-diabetes? How are we gonna get them more aware about the fact that we need a diabetes prevention program or diabetes oh, national yeah. diabetes? <laughs> and there's some a question about how do doctors know, know more about diet? That's so tough to answer. We yeah, I know. Too long. If, if, he knew the, but, if, if he knew the answer, we wouldn't be here but today. I think it, what is important for clinicians, both in primary care and hospital care, you know, is that we need to know more how to approach, um, you know, weight management in a more structured, simple way. And we have to address this all the time, mm -hmm. all the time, instead of quickly, you know, adjusting medications and putting That's patients right. on more medications and stressing to the patient that, you know, with weight loss, in fact, you could reduce your medications or, and you could even, you know, sometimes yeah. take off medications. And that's what, you know, I'm an advocate of that, you know, yes, you are. insulin on. You know, that's and, right. Yeah. So, I, but I not many people are. Yes, uh, among my right. endocrinology fraternity, I think, you know, the move is, you know, you've got so many sensational drugs now. <laughs> and, 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 and sensational and they're, they're so expensive uh, to, to get them there for everybody so mm. we need the same in interest uh, put in and focus in you know uh, in, in, in lifestyle intervention yeah. and very that's, early in the disease process that's right, right. At diagnosis in primary care mm. you know, that is and I like I like what Susan was sharing about while you're here let's talk about your weight that you get primary care physicians yeah. to yeah. start that conversation going and I think um, just if, if I may, Dr. Zan, to share with the group here, especially the Malaysians, that MBA and uh, actually MAMS under Dr. Zanaria will be rolling out. We are, mm -hmm. we, are, we are working out on a lifestyle education program for primary care physicians soon. So do watch out for that as well. Um, so I'm very aware of the time. Just perhaps one last question. There's something about um, Atkins diet on intermittent fasting. I think the question generally is, will it give the same effect as um, total diet replacement? Will, will it get, give the same effect on diabetes remission? What do you think? Susan, do you want to do that one? 
Well, I think it probably will. You know, the mechanism by which total diet replacement leads to remission from diabetes is weight loss. Um, that is the active component. And so I think that anything which leads to effective weight loss is, is probably going to have similar effects. Now, we don't have those remission trials in place explicitly, but I would be pretty confident that weight loss is, is what's mm -hmm. doing it. Um, and the important thing is to find the dietary approach that people can stick to. So intermittent diets do work. They're more or less effective than continuous dieting. But for some people, they find it easier to do intermittent diet so that mm -hmm. is the right diet for them and it is this question of helping as many people as possible to lose as much weight as they mm -hmm. are able to do so start with the best start offering total diet replacements and if that doesn't work work down through what are easier programs perhaps but are, are not going to be quite so mm -hmm. effective and maybe one last few words from dr leeds because you've always reminded me don't forget about micronutrients don't forget about diet quality because what i see in my practice with uh, some patients who go on low carbohydrates or very low carbohydrate diets is that the quality of the diet that's not enough fiber they don't pay enough attention to you know get eating a healthy diet and even with intermittent fasting during the eight hour period they could be eating all sorts of food that actually is not healthy choices so what, what do you you know and you've always reminded me about that dr leeds maybe you can yes. sum it up well, for us on this yes the, la the last comment I made was that we, I think we need more information about the optimal uh, composition of the weight maintenance diet. Uh, what should be the protein content? I, we haven't got extremely good experimental work mm -hmm. on the protein requirements during weight loss. Um, the interaction with physical activity, the effect of age, uh, the diets for older people may need to be different compared to the younger ones. And also, of course, the physical activity programs that we need to apply in parallel with everything else that we're doing in terms of both aerobic and uh, resistance training. And I think that many of the weight loss programs and maintenance programs we've seen don't actually have particularly active um, physical activity programs. The research teams that are looking at, for example, protein requirement in relation to physical activity will tell us that the timing of protein, the amino acid profile and so on, is all very important. So I think there's a huge amount of work still to do uh, mm -hmm. for us to work out what is the optimal yeah. Uh, weight maintenance program. Um, Susan and Paul, do you want yes. to just add to that? I, there's also quite a lot of questions about weight regain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So weight maintenance is really difficult, as in all the interventions that have been tried are marginally effective, some ineffective, and that's um, and the ones that do work sort of look like a continuation of a weight loss program, as in they provide regular support and so on. So you could suppose argue that actually what, what happens is weight goes down, it comes back up relatively slowly on average. Uh, individuals may vary, of course, and they do. Um, and so what might be better in rather than spending a lot of time and resource on weight maintenance, given we don't know, there's no single thing we can do. We know how to support weight loss. We don't know really how to support weight maintenance. So maybe we just concentrate on repeated episodes of weight loss rather than spending time worrying about weight loss maintenance, yeah. which is a bridge that we have not yet crossed. Yeah. May, may, sorry, may I just add that in the Copenhagen trial on, on people with osteoarthritis, an intermittent uh, intervention to bring the weight back down by two or three kilograms was actually used every four months and that worked over three years so there's experimental evidence that that can be done in that particular patient mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. um yeah. so there is okay. some evidence that, yes yeah. so i think we'll have to sum up now and uh thank you much everyone I, I think it's been a very very informative session uh we've been very privileged to hear some very very updated new data coming from the oxford team from dr leeds and dr zanaria giving us that great overview um and i think the, the at the end of the day it is do what is best for our patients do what they're willing to do um and try it out and if it doesn't work we can always you know use other alternatives but at the end of the day um there is a legacy effect it is still better whatever they do is that they lost some weight we know that that's going to be benefit even in the long term. And I think we need to continue this discussion. And I hope that everyone will just watch out. I think we'll have more of this webinar series. Maybe we should do one next round on weight 
uh, rigging? How do we prevent weight rigging? I think that will be very interesting to do. Yeah. So with that, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much, Susan, Dr. Litz and Dr. Zanaria thank and you. everyone else. Yeah. I hope I wish you a very good weekend. Um, thank, you. thank you for spending your Saturday with us for the UK team. And I wish you, you know, have a great time now of moving forward with your weekend. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank Look you. forward Bye -bye. to more Bye. announcement. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Zanaria. Now, this will be recorded, by the way, I forgot to tell you. And if you want your e-certificate, um, there's a QR code on the link there. And if you go there, we will send you um, the certificate as well. So you get the CPD points as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend.